Good morning, it's a frosty March 26, 2020. Welcome to another gardening vlog. Today my main goal is to actually get some stuff in the ground. Uh, maybe put in some early potatoes. Four weeks out to our last reliable last frost date, which is a good time to plant peas, uh, anything early under cover. You can put greens in the ground. As you can see here, we have a pretty good uh, frost last night, you know, it's still 30 degrees in the shade, but there's a lot of stuff that can survive that fine. You can see this tree collared leaf is crispy, frozen, but it'll be thaw out and just be fine. Same with the kale, it's just starting to thaw out as long as it's not like moved around and messed with too much while it's frozen, uh, it'll be fine. It might just be a little wilty for today or something. My tomato plant here under this cover looks uh, fine. So I think about an hour and a half before my new latest video premieres about me working on my uh, orchard uh, apple breeding project. Do that, hang out with you guys and chat for a while, and then I'll come back to uh, work. So let's see what we can get done today. Little apple seedling, I planted this. I think it was open pollinated or I just lost the tag or something. But I left one of them that looked interesting and I keep like looping it back on itself like this to keep it from uh, just growing out of control, which is kind of cool. It's a neat it's a neat form. If you did that actually intentionally and more carefully, it could be pretty neat. But I've been waiting and waiting for this thing to bloom and it's finally producing a few blossoms this year. We'll find out this year what's up with that. This is the sage I cook with all the time and I cook with it a lot. I use sage all the time, almost daily. I want to cut this way back to kind of like refresh the plant. You can see down here, I hope, where I cut these way back super hard, like down to the ground, they're sprouting up back here like pretty thick it's going to grow back uh very not only well but better because uh, it won't have all this clogged up growth and it'll just really put a lot into growing so what i'm going to do though is take a few cuttings i wouldn't mind having a couple more plants anyway so i'm just going to take whatever cuttings that are on here that look like i might be able to uh, root them really all the way back to get rid of all this dead stuff and try to renew this plant i don't know where this sage originates from i mean there's native sages all over the world we have a number of them here one of which i grow a lot of uh, black sage it's my one of my favorite native plants and uh, i make smudge sticks out of it and i want to propagate some more of that this year too and expand my plantings of it this one right here actually has some root on it so i could uh i think i'll just go ahead and pot that up and take off most of these leaves. As the plant lays over, it will root into the ground, like this piece here, but I'm gonna leave that. So I got a couple here that, that should grow. Now that should grow back as a profusion of nice uh, shoots. It got rid of all that messy, bushy, tangled stuff. It's getting out into the path and stuff, so. Took off all these side branches. Now, you know, this doesn't have any roots, right? So. The leaves, if I leave any anything on here, the leaves will just pull out uh, water from the stem and dry it out because they need water and they're, they're constantly sweating. So if they're transpiring water and giving off water, that water's coming from this stem, which is not taking up any water, or at least not much yet. And when you're propagating cuttings like this, some plants will propagate better from green cuttings that are still very juicy and green, like new growth. Some will propagate better from old growth that's woody, and some will propagate best from semi-hardwood cuttings that are in between. Chances are these cuttings are going to do quite well here. And I'm going to have way more sage plants than I actually need. I'm going to put some big chunky charcoal in the bottom of this just to take up some space and to plug these giant holes. I don't know why they put giant holes in the, these pots. There must be some explanation, but I don't get it. Just the soil ends up falling out. Anyway, I've spent a lot of time, uh, you know, in tension basically, trying to garden self-reliantly and not bring in a lot of uh, resources from the outside, especially stuff I have to buy. I got some of this potting soil 
donator and I was using it the other day and I was like, wow, this is so convenient. <laughs> like I don't have to stop and basically make potting mix, but I'm sure glad I've invested in self-reliant gardening skills, essentially made myself experiment. A friend of mine that grows weed, um, which don't be surprised, like that's what most people do here, was telling me that it provides his gardening budget. And I was like, what, you have a gardening budget? Like I buy oyster shell, grafting paint, uh, sometimes rootstock. I mean, I just don't buy that much. The idea of having a, a gardening budget in the thousands of dollars, I'm just like, whoa, that's a foreign concept to me. And I'm glad it's a foreign concept to me. So we'll be talking more about ways you can garden self-reliantly. I still, you know, make the vast majority of my planting mixes and stuff. I'm not a Luddite either, and don't don't confuse self-reliance and self-sufficiency. Self-reliance is more like your ability to function, you know, carrying and embodying skills and knowledge that allow you to be a semi-autonomous, self-contained person and, and kind of take care of yourself, right? It doesn't mean that you have to reject all other resources from the outside. Like, you, we really should be relying on each other more in a lot of ways um, for resiliency, actually. But there's a difference between being like hard, hard dependency and having a lot of ability to fend for yourself, which also means you have more to offer other people, which is, means you have more to trade with other people. So yeah, there's a there's a difference between being a you know being willing to take advantage of what's available to you and being totally dependent on it. See, different. Uh, Carol Depp, garden writer, makes that distinction, and I, I really like the way she talks about that. I could also plant these sage uh, directly into the ground, but I don't know where I want them or anything. So it's easy for me to just throw them in a pot here and and then if later in the summer I might decide I want some more sage somewhere and put them out. And with these I just want to keep them good and damp, you know, not soaking wet, not sodden and, and waterlogged. So in my last garden vlog there were 22 apple seedlings up and now there's over 60 more and more every day busting out here. Looking good. Here's a nifty tool. We'll probably use this today, the planting board. It's got uh, notches every six inches and the, the board's actually five and a half inches wide. These are six inches apart this way. If it was actually a six inch wide board, they'd be more than six inches apart. So this gives you like a grid type of spacing. And then I often use it with another, you know, mark spots in between these for three inches or two spots for two inch spacing. Very handy tool. So I'm gonna prep this bed up. It's pretty much ready. I just gotta pick out some grass that got left when it was dug. A couple of gardening vlogs ago, I think, I was digging this uh, bed and adding a bunch of charcoal to it. Now I'm gonna plant it to various roots. They are gonna be onions in this end and then beets and carrots. But I do have some onion starts that I picked up. I wish I'd gotten a lot more. If I do go to town, which I'm kinda, I am kinda need to make a town run, one last town run here. I'll look for some more, but all of my onion seed turned out to be bad. It's just, it was just too old. Since I haven't had a garden for a couple of years, I don't really know what's up with my seed stash, but onion seeds don't keep that well. And it was literally like a hundred percent failure on my onions. The leeks are fine, but not the onions. So I can rely uh, pretty heavily on leeks instead of onions and that's okay. But I would like to plant more if I can get some it starts. Now I like onion starts, like the little plants, bare root plants, uh, versus those little sets, like those little tiny bulbs. I just, I haven't really had that much luck with those things. It seems like they're always trying to flower more and would probably plant them if that's all I could find. It seems that this, the, uh, the plant starts have become a lot more popular now than the, the sets, at least around here. My primary interest in onions is keeping onions because I'm like a pragmatic, practical, subsistence type of gardener, typically. Get this pretty flat to start with. Sometimes it's possible to plant things closer together, end up having the plants be basically stunted, somewhat stunted, like these, a lot of these are ending up about six inches apart. And there's plenty of room for the physical body of the plant, more than enough room, it's an onion. I mean, it's, it's like a big grass type of shape but the roots are spreading out underground competing for resources with the other onion plants so it's possible sometimes to 
end up with smaller plants but more food overall than with a bigger spacing. So when you plant on a grid like this, you can fit a lot more plants in a small space. I can fit more than if I go on a square grid like this, see, versus like this. This will fit more plants per area. It is actually significant over the size of a bed, but that sometimes will just allow you to get into this mindset of, oh, I want to plant more plants, like fit more plants and because you're going to grow more food in a small area. But sometimes it goes the other way where you end up with uh, smaller plants and less food. One thing I've done is started to plant tomatoes a lot further apart than I used to. Cool, we have exactly enough of these. So I started out like seven inches Maybe ended up a little bit closer together, but that's all right. I do have a few more starts and grab those. With onions, I'll usually cut or tear off the some of the root. It's easier to plant. Most years I put in a garden planning to take really good care of it, and then I don't. Absent-minded professor brain. I just get super focused on one thing, and I forget about the garden for days at a time. But I have a feeling I'll have more motivation to be growing lots of food this year. Alarm. I gotta go in and about as soon as I'm done with this and hang out with you guys on chat. Just the right amount again. Onions. Man, they sure do taste good and make food good and make it easier to cook good food. I really have like another 15 minutes or 10 minutes, so I'm going to do one more thing before we go. Carefully flatten this entire bed. Now, I often will do this with every bed. Like, if I wasn't going to add anything to the soil, stuff on top of the plants, on top of the soil, then I wouldn't. You know, I would just leave it. What we're going to do with this bed in particular, I really need it to be quite flat. Since I don't dig very much, I dug this bed and I'm digging some beds this year. But I mean, in the past, I've done a lot of gardening without any digging just to see how that worked for me. With those beds, I'll typically get them pretty flat and then add amendments on top. So my sifted compost, grass, you know, sawdust, uh, leaf mulch from the woods, coffee grounds, ashes, just anything and and little bits of those add up on the surface of the soil. And if the soil isn't flat, it doesn't spread well. And then when you water it, it runs off the high points into the low points. Okay, I should have just another five minutes or so. So I'm gonna go grab some kale plants and put them in here. So it looks like we have some kale starts here where I threw down like an old bunch of kale stalks that had gone to flower and seed. Maybe three. I'll take three, but I'm probably only going to plant two. Again, you know, it's possible that if I planted three, I would end up getting more food out of this space, but I'm going to go with bigger, wider spaced. Now, I don't know what kale this is. I'm going to plant that deep. Great. I like the looks of this one and this one, and all of these are going to get broken off. This one looks the best. I'm actually going to go ahead and take off some leaf area here to give these guys a chance to establish themselves without transpiring too much. I think I'm just going to go ahead and leave this one. If these don't do well, I've got plenty more I can just go grab. I'm really liking the looks of this one. Again, take off a couple of leaves here. Those I want to water immediately, and then I got to run off to the computer for my Premier. By the way, let me know what you guys think of Premier. I kind of like it because if I'm going to schedule something that's going to come out at a certain time anyway, I might as well just let you guys know ahead and then go and hang out. I know when it first came out, a lot of people were complaining about it on YouTube, and I didn't really get it, what the problem was. So I'm just going to just run a little water right onto it here. That's it. Okay, see you soon. So my uh, video premiere just finished up and I'm looking at this chestnut crab tree and thinking I might want to do a few pollinations today. So 
what will happen is once I've picked off a few of these to gather for pollen, there's only, you know, so many left like here. And if I take this off right here, pinch that off, then I have two balloon stage flowers that I can pollinate and then let go to fruit. You see the advantage here? Like if I start with a cluster that has like this, and then one, one or two mornings I come out and pick a few of these off to gather pollen, then I still have a few left. If I was gonna pollinate this, I would only pollinate probably these two, maybe these two, but I'd have to pick these off and then I can't get those for pollen. I think there's four to six clusters that like that, that uh, just have a couple of balloon stage flowers left that I could do. Got myself a nice uh, crispy dosa. Best described as a uh, savory fermented sourdough crepe, but it's made with rice and dal, or uh, I use red lentils, the little tiny, you know, fluorescent orange lentils. They're super tasty and the batter's really easy to make. You can make enough for like a week and then I just, you know, dish out a couple every once in a while. Super good. Got some uh, pollen here. All the black packets are from last year. Some of this other stuff is uh, pretty old. Could be from the year before, the year before that, maybe even the year before that. So I'm looking for stuff here to cross with chestnut crab and with William's Pride. I may cross William's Pride onto chestnut. I may do Wixen, not Pomosinel. Corpendu Platt's a, a candidate. I think I did that cross last year. Becca's Crab is a candidate. Pink Parfait is always a candidate. Rubiot's a candidate. Red Fleshed Medley. Hmm, that's an interesting possibility. The thing about using a, a pollen mix, these medleys that I make, is that each seed in an apple could be pollinated with something different. That's pretty interesting. Sam Young, still tempting. Rubiot, still tempting. Red Medley, tempting. Let's go with Red Medley instead of Rubiot. This one's the most definite one. Um, Becca's Crab, pretty tempting. Let's skip Pink Parfait. Let's skip Pendragon. Let's not skip Pendragon. Golden Nugget, Hindu, and Wixen. Okay, let's forego the Wixen in favor of the Wixen Rubiot Cross because this has red flesh jeans and I just want to mix it up a bit. And I've already done a lot of Wixen chestnut crab crosses. This is priority. Let's start with this. Okay, this one's perfect right here. We have one, two, three flowers. These two are ready. This one's almost opening already. This one probably isn't, but I may as well go ahead and try to pollinate it. On some varieties, it's hard to get the petals off without messing anything up. But on this variety, it's easy. So in recent years, I have not been taking off the male parts of the seed parent like this. And uh, oh good, I have lots of this pollen. So there could be some chance of like self-pollination, but it's so much faster. You know, if it's absolutely critical that you're sure of what your crosses are and nothing accidental happens, you would want to remove the male parts around the outside here, these little yellow ball things that we collect for pollen, and bag that. We'll do the same cross on this one. Now the reason the bees won't visit these is because there's no flower petals. So to them it's just like another flower that's already done its thing. Because the uh, petals are like a big bullseye, right? They're like, hey, you sexy bee, come over here and get some nectar. X, rube, and this is 13-2 is the number designation of that cross. It doesn't have a name yet. I did a couple of pollinations with this variety, Golden Nugget. It's not actually an amazing apple here, but its parents are two of the best apples still that I've ever tasted, uh, which is Golden Russet and Cox's Orange Pippin. So I just feel like this is a good cross to make. Um, Chestnut crab tends toward a russet type of apple, and given that this is a russet and it has the best russet I've ever tasted as a parent, it just seems like a good idea. So I'm gonna pick out a couple more clusters, do a couple more things, and then I'm gonna pick off some of these balloon stage flowers to collect pollen from to send out to you guys, then I'm back to gardening. Okay, here we go. Golden Nugget, uh, Sam Young, which is this really tasty, late hanging, late-ish hanging little russet uh, wick, Wixen with Rubiot cross, uh, Golden Russet, and Corpendu Platt. Small, tasty russet with scab resistance. And I got a handful of balloon stage blossoms to gather a little pollen from. <laughs> this is manure tea. 
its chicken manure tea. And I will put it in here in this watering can, dilute it with water, and then apply it directly to plants. And I'm going to dilute this quite a bit, like at least three to one. It's pretty strong. And this is relevant for the next project. So I'm just going to fill the rest of this with water. So it's going to be about a quarter chicken manure tea. These make rootstocks. Once they start growing up, I'll put these uh, bottomless cans over them, fill them with damp sawdust, and those will produce rootstocks, new rootstocks with little roots on them. So once that manure tea is used up, which means I'll like use all the liquid off the top of the manure, add water, let it sit again, use that, add water, maybe do that three times or so. Then I'm left with this stuff, just sludgy organic matter. Now you're wondering how bad this smells. It's really not that bad, but this is pretty aged. It's like over a year old. Occasionally you'll get a batch that smells really bad. Typically it really isn't that bad and it's pretty much gone in a short amount of time. Basically this is a pourable sheet mulch. Spoon this out and pour on a nice layer. Now it's a little thick. Besides, to a hardcore gardener, manure is the smell of plants growing. played with different ways to apply this. This is kind of clumsy and it doesn't go on very even. I've used a wide mouth watering can. I've done this. I've poured it out of buckets, like square bucket with a flat side. That works pretty good. I only use this on crops that are going to stand for a long time. You know, I'm not going to use it on a short crop of lettuce or greens or radishes, coal crops, broccoli, kale tomatoes, peppers, onions, leeks. And then I also will take the hose and just water it. And that washes the stuff around and evens it out. That really does help a lot. Since I use a lot of this manure tea, I just happen to have all this sludge. And one day I was like, I should pour that on the beds. You could do this with other stuff too and add other things. Like I think grass, I never have grass clippings, but I'm sure they would be good. Um, plus anything that's fibrous kind of makes more like a paper consistency. So this is a little uneven, but it protects the soil surface from crusting. You know, when I water the soil, it won't get damaged. It just, it'll just pull the water down in there once it gets all settled into place. It's pretty cool. Try to figure out what to call it. I'm kind of thinking liquid sheet mulch, maybe. Something like that. This stuff right here is kind of weird. It looks like it has a lot of sawdust in it. It doesn't really have that paper-like consistency that I usually get. I don't know what was in there. So yeah, I don't really, this stuff didn't spread that well. It's got a lot of like chunky stuff and sawdust and I don't know what in it. Stuff, when I use up those other batches of chicken manure tea, they should be a little better and a little more, uh, when you pour them out, like they form more like a, almost a paper uh, sheet. And also applying to small crops like this is a little more tricky than just say if you had like four tomato plants in here and you can kind of just dump the stuff in mass spray it around with the hose a little bit and you're done. The advantage is it protects the soil. That's number one. It protects the soil from water. So when I water this area here that's really well covered, the water won't damage the soil at all. In fact, the, the mulch seems to help pull the water in really fast. So I can water a lot without having it start to run off and without causing this kind of like soil damage that seals up the surface of the soil and prevents the water from going in. Soil crusting, I have a whole video on soil crusting. This has limited application, like I wouldn't go collecting a bunch of stuff to try to make this necessarily. It just happens to work with what I already do for fertilizing, which is making a lot of manure teas with chicken manure, and then I have this stuff left over, and it's pretty easy to apply it. And the benefits can actually be really, really good. Whenever I use up another batch of manure tea, I'll fill in some thin spots here and finish that up probably. I don't need to add any other nutrients to this right now because I added so much nutrient to this bed already. And obviously even in the left 
the, the old used up manure tea, there's still a lot of nutrients in there. So, you know, I would need to start feeding this for a little while. However, if anyone remembers from the previous uh, gardening vlog video where I dug this bed, it has a ton of charcoal in it, which is going to act as a nutrient sink. So I will be fertilizing this uh, through the year quite a bit. And the rest of this bed is probably going to be beets and definitely carrots. I think it's nap time. Steven needs a nap. I woke up at 2.30 this morning. I think I fell back asleep, but not for long. I've got a hankering for a salad, big time. I just got that feeling like, oh, I need, I need a salad. Fresh food. I don't have a lot of greens in the garden yet. Typically, I would have all kinds of stuff, but this year, there wasn't any real winter garden. I have a little bit of kale. I might go grab some of that for this, but... Uh, this is miner's lettuce, really good wild green. This is actually grown in Europe as a green, and I think it's naturalized. Some of you people from maybe England could speak to that. It's a very good green. It, it actually is worthy of uh, selection and breeding, I think. It's very juicy, mild flavored, like thick succulent leaves, and they're really cool looking too, so. There's a nice patch of it here that I've been eyeing. And these will get real big sometimes, you know, like three inches across, maybe bigger, if they're grown carefully and with uh, selection and good culture. I think you could grow these huge, like four inches, I'm thinking it would be achievable. In fact, I may have seen them, I've definitely seen them three inches across. And that's with no selection, that's just wild stock, but just grown out really with tons of nutrients, like in a hugel culture. I think before I knew what hugel culture was, I did that, um, just piling up stuff in the backyard. I remember growing these just like gigantic miner's lettuce. See, like that. Very attractive. Could float that on a something like a lily pad. If you bred them right, I bet you could get them to grow more like a funnel so you could fill them with stuff. You know, goat cheese with herbs and minced up olives in there, stuff like that. A big three or four inch cone full of that. Yeah, that's possible. Someone's just gotta do it. So that's what the plant looks like. Let's go see what else we can find to stick in here. So one thing I'll put a little bit of in is this plant here, which is like a wild dandelion type of plant, but it's not dandelion. It's in the lettuce family. It's bitter. A few nice tender young kale leaves. Quite a few. I want a big salad. I did a video this winter where I was just running around working on stuff, I think, and I was picking olives. Well, these are some of those olives. These are the Dolce de Morocco. They turned out uh, real good. They held their texture great. They have a, a great kind of um, firm, rubbery texture. Soaked in a salt brine, a couple changes of salt brine. Only two though, I think. They're a little bit bitter. Maybe too bitter for some people, but I think three, maximum four changes of brine would make them palatable for anybody. I like them a little bitter. And then they're marinated in vinegar, herbs, pepper, a skim of olive oil, and water, and wine, red wine. Quite a bit of red wine. I'll pour some of this juice, too, on my salad as salad dressing. Well, here we go. Shrimp, olives, a bunch of different greens, a little bit of cheese, some hippie dust. That's uh, what people around here call brewer's yeast. It's really good in salads and popcorn. I don't really use it that much, but I use it on those things all the time because it's so good. I'll see you guys on the other end of this salad. So I'm gonna do an experiment here. I've thought a lot about how to add the charcoal and soil here in a certain amount. And I think I'm gonna to try to do it by shovelfuls. That way I can kind of spread it evenly as I go. And the downside to this method is that I have to loosen this soil first. Like I can't take a big chunk of that and throw it in and, and get any kind of accurate measurement. So I'm gonna to have to basically go through this whole pile and do this. And I just don't really see a lot of alternative. 
The good thing is I can look for interesting rocks, <laughs> which is fun. I can uh, pull some of the rock out and use it somewhere. Since I'm adding quite a bit of charcoal, I can take some of the bulk of this out and I'd rather that was rocks. Okay, so this is the 15% section. So I'm looking at scoops and I just wanna see how a scoop, like a standard scoop of dirt, I'm gonna kinda like shake it a little, say like that. So far that seems pretty consistent, you know? Yeah, so I can make a similar size scoop of charcoal. I think this is gonna work. Spread this pretty even. And I may not even really have to mix anything. It's tedious, but it's simple. And I can come out and just nibble away at it. Decide if I wanna put any fertilizers in here. And what I'm thinking at this point is that I will put a consistent amount of fertilizer in every section. And that amount will be basically geared toward being correct in the middle sections and a little low on this end and a little high on that end. But I want it consistent so that the results are, can, are, are show some kind of a difference, right? Ideally, I would like to start this project with no fertilizers, except for the oyster shell, that's different, but no like nitrogen fertilizers, no kind of like uh, NPK type of fertilizers, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. The reason I'm not gonna do that though is because I really, really wanna grow a crop of corn on here and I want it to succeed because I really want that food this year. I want that, that crop of dry corn to make tortillas with for the rest of the uh, year. I'm gonna sac partially sacrifice the experiment. And if I do everything the same in each section except for the char, I will still be able to see potentially see some difference. And I'll know going forward that if I always treat everything the same, which I will, Regardless of how the corn grows, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna add more of anything to any one section. I'll know that I've always been consistent across everything except for the one thing that's different, which is the char. Time to plant some fava beans. This is very late for me planting fava beans. I usually plant them in the fall. Uh, they don't like the winter. They don't do very well, but they get established. Like they keep getting nipped by the frost. They look terrible, but in the spring they just take off because the roots are already underneath them, but I'm gonna plant them anyway and just see if I can get away with it because I really want to grow a big crop of fava beans. I like them a lot. They freeze really well. I think they'll probably grow. Now the problem is I don't know how old these seeds are. I know they're, they're old. They could be many years old. They could be not viable, but I'm gonna plant them anyway. I have some more on the way, so I'll probably plant those too, but just uh, somewhere else. So what I'm gonna do is plant them probably about 12 inches apart, and I'm just gonna guesstimate that on a grid, take this pick and just like chop little spots, blaze through here doing that, and then come back and put the seeds in. I just think that's gonna be a quick, easy way to get this planted and get these bulbs out of the way careful here not to uh, bump my grass too much. Just like that, boom, every foot. 14 inches, 12 inches, doesn't really matter. Baba beans are great. They're good for your soil. They're good to eat. Apparently some people are deadly allergic to them. That warning seems to just uh, follow fava beans wherever they go. Kind of go for like a staggered pattern here, but I'm a little off, I really don't care. So I'm just gonna throw a couple seeds in each hole. I would only want one to grow, but I don't know how old the seed is, so it's easy to just drop two or three seeds in there. You know, if the seed's viable, I don't really want to use it up. But if it's old and weak, which seed does get old and weak, it's not just a matter of like, does it germinate or not? Like, it's is it strong? seed or not. Work is so much easier if you are willing to crawl around and get down on the ground and get dirty rather than being like upright and dignified. All right, I have some new fava bean seed coming. I ordered like, I think a quarter pound or something. This year, whatever I end up growing, I will save some seed. Boink. No, it's supposed to rain uh, for two days to after tomorrow, so I'm just gonna, gonna leave it. I may fertilize this later, but I don't need to do it now. I'm not gonna mulch it with anything because I can't afford to. I don't have enough stuff. I don't want to take the time to go get it. It's not important enough. Maybe 
When they come up, if I have time, I'll go get oak leaves or I'll take some oak leaves that I have over here and I'll, I'll move them, you know, cultivate around the plants and then throw some mulch on for the rest of the season. That might be worthwhile, but we'll see when we get there. Oh wait, that's not beets, that's chard. <laughs> which is a beet. It's just a beet that's grown for leaf greens. So I have a few beets planted here. I think there's about 20. They didn't come up very well. This is some seed that I saved, but I saved seed from a yellow one and a red one that were growing together, and the yellow one completely didn't come up at all unless they crossed and all the offspring are red. But anyway, there's only about 20 here. I need more than that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to direct seed the beet section and I'm going to save these as backup in case things go wrong. This is the seed I used. It was a cross between like a touchstone beet and which is a yellow beet and Detroit red and it looks like only the Detroit red came up. It didn't come up like super strong so I'm going to use a combination of this seed and two other seeds. I'm going to mix them all together and just use a ton of seed and pick out the strongest plants that come up. Okay Detroit this is from 2016, pretty old. This is fresh seed, but like I said, it didn't do amazing. I mean, these look okay. So like I said, I'd rather just plant tons of seed. And then I have touchstone. I love this beet, it's a golden beet. And I'll be able to tell the difference even if I plant them all in the same holes. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna mix all the seed and all the holes. Touchstone is a really good golden beet. It's the best one I've grown. There's an old one called Burpees, I think it is. Um, there's an old standard yellow beet that's really terrible. It seems just weak and inbred and never grows well. It's very small, it tastes great, but this actually grows well, it grows quite large, and it's very, very good. So highly recommend that variety. These two are excellent varieties for a red and a gold. Detroit is a very old variety, but it's just really reliable. Now, if you don't like beets, perhaps you haven't had them cooked Right. I'm going to tell you something to try. Sautéing grated beets in butter. Use plenty of butter. Uh, Sauté them on a low to med medium low heat and cook them for a long time until like the bulk of them is reduced by probably half. So they're just going to really shrink down and they're going to lose a ton of water. They're going to concentrate all the sugars in the beet and they're gonna start to slowly, gently caramelize into something that tastes pretty amazing. So I'm just trying to get this nice and flat here. Now I wanna beat every three inches. I usually want the beet beets to end up about six inches apart like this, like six to eight inches. And this is a six inch planting board. So I'm gonna do that, but I'm gonna plant one extra seed between each like this. So I'll just get my finger in here and kind of like push a little spot. And sometimes I'll just use like a little stick to do this. Now version 2.0 of this planting board that I've invented in my head will be different and require some testing. But it's a really fantastic tool if you use wide bed planting. Okay, so now in between each of these, I'm gonna make another divot. I think the easiest way to approach this, again, I don't know, this seed's gotta be from 2016 or earlier, 2016. So it's four years old. It's probably still good, but it could be weak. So I'm gonna drop about two seeds of this in each hole. And a beet seed actually contains uh, multiple seeds in one husk. There's just a little trick I came up with to uh, keep track, right? So I can say from this side of the bed, I plant up to this bamboo stake, and then on the other side, I plant up to the bamboo stake, and then I don't miss anything or double plant anything. I don't want to use up 100% of my seed if I can't help it. And I'm running a little low here, so I'm gonna have to go to one seed of this per hole. Save a few seeds, just because it's like a rule, you don't plant all your seed. I'm gonna go ahead and use this new beet seed with the Detroit Red. And I'm going to use a lot of this seed because I have a lot of it. I'd rather thin than take any chances on germination or sparse growth here. Be super sloppy, just dumping some seeds in there. One nice thing about saving your own seed is you don't have to be like all stingy with it because man you can use up seed fast if you're not careful and it is not cheap. 
if anyone's ordered seed recently, you're like, wait, what? How did my shopping cart end up being 40 bucks or 50 bucks? Or... I'm pretty frugal with my seed shopping. I've learned my lesson over and over again about getting sucked into all those like fancy descriptions. I swear people want to be fooled when it comes to uh, seed catalogs. It's just like, ooh, that sounds so good. But I have to have this one too. It was the best winner of the taste test. And it's huge, or it's purple. I'm not gonna grow these beets three inches apart until they're big. I'm going to thin out the weak beets. Uh, some of them may end up three inches apart. Some will end up six inches apart, but I'm not gonna grow all these beets here until they're big. So the thing about this system, I have something to eat while the beets are getting bigger. I'll eat the weakest, uh, lamest ones and leave the nice big ones to grow. And the other thing is I can take these and move them around. So if there's like a big area where nothing grew, I can dig a few things up and kind of move them over there. Because uh, when they're young, they transplant pretty well. I mean, they do fine uh, grown in a flat and transplanted out. Now what? Now I want something on this soil surface. When I water this, the, the water is going to, no matter how careful I am, I have a video on watering uh, fan sprayers and why they're good, and on soil crusting. And those two videos describe a little bit about what happens when you water soil. In most soils, you're going to kind of compact and crust over the surface of the soil, which makes it dry out faster, allows l for less air exchange between the air in the soil, which is uh, you want air exchange. So if you can get anything on the soil, like any kind of even thin organic matter cover, it will break the fall of the water and keep that crusting from happening. And of course also it slows evaporation, keeps the moisture in while the seeds are germinating. I mean, there's all kinds of advantages. So I'm gonna grab some different things to sprinkle on here. First thing I have is some coffee grounds. I get coffee grounds for my neighbors and I save my own coffee grounds. I have in the past sometimes gotten them in town. Certainly America is addicted to large quantities of coffee. I know I am. Like we're just a coffee ground producing machine. You can get a lot of free grounds in town. Go to coffee shops, those little like little coffee centers and cafes and restaurants, breakfast restaurants. If they have room, like leave some lidded buckets and say like, I'll consistently pick these up on a certain day if you'll save your coffee grounds for me. And don't hassle them with like removing the filters. Tell them it's okay to put the filters in. Amazing fertilizer. And they have the added benefit of being able to do this, which just is another thing to add to the top of your soil keep it from crusting, keep it from drying out. It just slowly feeds the soil. They're very high in nitrogen, magnesium. I don't even know what else, but some good stuff. They make plants grow. A lot of people are afraid to use them because they think they're too acidic. Uh, don't sweat it, just use them. Never seen a problem. I use really large quantities. Okay, uh, getting this watered in, this is good. They're, they're watered in enough to germinate and uh, it's all good. I may cover this with like mosquito netting to protect it from birds. I'll get quail in here. About this time of year, they start nesting around this area and they'll come in the garden and dig around and make dirt baths in the, the beds. Also, if I get earwigs, which will be coming out as soon as it warms up, they're like this nasty insect with pinchers for tails. Those guys could eat seedlings too. So sometimes I'll put mosquito net on and actually like, you know, weight the sides down so the bugs can't even get in there. This section will be carrots and I still want to do a like well-crafted concise video that's really planned out and well executed on that subject. Whether I'll get that done or I, I don't know or not, but I'll tell you how I do it right now just in case you want to get some carrots planted. You can grow a lot of carrots in a small space with this method. Use a planning board, mark every six inches, and then mark every two inches in between. So between each six inch mark, you're gonna make two divots. So it's like every two inches. When you're done with that, you're gonna actually go down the middle and do that again. So every, every carrot plant seed spot is two inches away from the others, like staggered, you know, same thing we did there, but just like completely filled in every two inches. Plant uh, three to four seeds per hole. Like I'm pretty sloppy about it, but you know, shoot for about three average. And then instead of covering that with dirt, I cover it with sifted compost or something like that. It could be potting mix. You can cover them gently with soil or sprinkle some soil in there. 
but I really like to just put the, the compost on and it actually fills up the holes. And so the compost is like right on top of the seed and they germinate really well and they get fed right away. As those grow up, thin them out to the strongest seedlings every two inches. And as those grow up, thin out the weakest carrots and use those and eat those and leave the biggest, strongest carrots. So that way, as soon as they start to really grow, you have carrots to eat for a long season. You can grow a lot of carrots in even a small space like this using that method. And in this climate, they'll overwinter. So what I'll probably do is plant this small section for like summer carrots. And then later when like one of the other beds gets cleared off, like I pull something out like a spring crop, I will go ahead and put in um, another bigger crop for overwintering and I'll eat those through to next spring. That's how I do carrots. One more thing I want to say about planting the carrots here. You can see I actually already made the divots to plant this and then I decided to do a really good video on it. So I'm going to actually mess it up for my video and do it over again, which is a bunch of work. I mean, it's a tedious way to plant carrots, but if you want to get a lot of carrots out of a small space, it's pretty hard to beat. Because if you're starting a garden, like a new gardener, and you did only one bed, I would recommend planting a small crop of carrots like this. You know, this is a four foot wide bed. Four by four feet is good. Uh, four by three at least, four by five, whatever. And grow carrots that way. It's very rewarding. You'll get a lot of food out of it. It's very, very practical. And the quality, of course, of like a homegrown carrot is so much better. The only thing store carrots are better for, I've noticed, is juice because since they're stored for a long time, the starches convert over to sugar and they're sweeter. So um, that's the only advantage I see. Homegrown carrots are just uh, delicious, cooked in salted water with butter or sauteed, like cubed up and saute them really slowly in butter until they reduce in size and get all caramelized. Super good. So I just talked for like 15 minutes and I think the camera was off. This is a continual problem. I can't just leave the camera running because it, it's too much footage to sort through. I run out of card, I run out of battery, but I'm constantly like going, oh, the camera wasn't on. I've been talking for five minutes, you know. I'm working on planting some potatoes here. I decided to go ahead and dig this bad. I think I'm a, I might do some potato planting experiments. Uh, I saw a video recently where these guys threw down like a bunch of spoiled hay. I wish I could remember. I'll try to put the name of the, the channel on the screen. They threw spoiled hay down in the fall, pulled it aside in the spring, dropped the potatoes under the mulch, and then mulched it a little more and just let them grow in that on the ground surface like they didn't even plant them in the ground. And I've tried that before in similar things. Um, I've tried the container method. None of it's ever worked that well. I'm not a very good potato grower tell you the truth. But I kind of like that idea. The thing is with a lot of those methods and a lot of stuff you hear about that's like, wow, this is like this miracle way to grow food and it's super easy and there's no work. They almost always rely on heavy amounts of imports. Like these guys got, you know, free hay, spoiled hay, not straw. I don't think. I think it was actually hay, um, which means that it was green grass or alfalfa, which is really good fertilizer. I mean, if you have to gather all of that grass or all that material, it represents quite a bit of work rather than just like scoring a truckload of free spoiled hay. Now, when I moved here, I had a real strong interest in self-reliant gardening and not bringing in a lot of stuff. For my fruit trees, I brought in a lot of like wood chips and I used some in the garden, but not that much. And there's other things I'll talk about it sometime. But for the most part, I was like, well, what can I do without bringing in a lot of imports? If I can't do that and I can't prove that to myself, then I'm basically just a dependent gardener and I don't know what I'm capable of. So let's say I wanted to do this, uh, you know, spoiled hay method. If you're going to put down, you know, 10 to 12 inches of dry hay, that represents a lot of grass that you have to cut and rake and move. And I'm not saying it wouldn't be worth it, but it's not the same as just getting all these free materials all the time. So, you know, when people ask, why don't I use the uh, back to Eden method? I think it's called the Eden method or something. You know, I just... Well, for one thing, I don't want to spend all of my time moving mulch and shoveling mulch. 
There's no way I'm going to get anything delivered here. I got mulch delivered once because you know, someone knew the guy who drove the truck. But it's too far out here for them to come out. Whether I'm going to do it for the rest of my life or not, or whether I need to, I'm interested in what it takes for me to grow food here with low inputs. Very different. Gardening can be either expensive or heavily dependent, or both, on outside stuff. And if I were to write a gardening book, it would be about gardening non-dogmatically and toward the ability, whether you do it all the time or not, again, to be self-reliant. Notice I'm digging with one hand. Not very difficult. I'm moving as little as possible. Really not working that hard. Don't be fooled. My soil is very nice, friable loam. It's actually in better shape this bed than I thought it would be. Pretty much because it sat fallow for two years. It's got all the grass roots and stuff in here. So I guess what I'm saying is a lot of people are, you know, who use lots of mulch or have seen these videos in these systems are gonna say, why don't you, why are you digging that? Why are you um, removing those weeds? Why don't you just put on 12 inches of mulch? Well, because I need to get 12 inches of mulch. And if I don't import a lot of stuff, that suddenly becomes a whole different proposition. And it's a treadmill that you stay on. You just, you have to keep adding the stuff. I'm not totally opposed at all to using any outside inputs. I'm not talking about self-sufficiency or being a Luddite. And I have used, especially to get stuff established, I've used truckloads and truckloads of wood chips. Most of them were used to establish fruit trees. Um, and guess how much of those wood chips are still here? Zero percent. And when I look at the sites where I used, you know, six, eight, ten inches of wood chips, they don't really look any different than the surrounding area. I mean, it's not like there's some kind of like super persistent, amazing effect that lasts forever. And it also, in some, depending on the situation, it can cause some problems too. Like perennial weeds grow better usually if you mulch them, unless you can really sheep mulch them out and kill them completely. No mulch propaganda tells you about that. It's harder to see gopher activity. Like if I grow a big bed of potatoes here that really has a really deep mulch, the, the gophers could be down there just wiping me out and I won't even know it. So it's not all chocolate and roses. Take that mulch propaganda with a grain of salt. Amazing tool, super valuable. It can be almost miraculous and amazing, sure. But don't drink the Kool-Aid. Consume that information and try it with an open and, you know, healthy, healthy skeptic mind. Ditch the dogma, try different things, see what actually works. Check every kind of like permaculture, thing you run across and just ask that one question. How much of this stuff has come in from the outside? If the claim is that eventually it's going to produce all of its own stuff and not need any inputs, um, where's the model like that that has actually happened? It may exist, I wouldn't know. i just just saying. It's a good question to ask. Okay, I got that bed nice and cleaned off. I think I'll practice uh, clean cultivation in this bed, which just means that as I water it during the summer, I'll just come in with a hoe and break up the soil and just leave the bare soil. But always make sure it's chopped up. That way air can get in. Um, when I water it, you know, it'll kind of like crust down and then it'll dry out again really fast because of that crust. So right after I water each time, I'll come through and just really quickly cultivate it, which should not take very long, but you do have to keep up with it. So that's one disadvantage of clean cultivation. So I think I'm going to plant my early potatoes in here, and I'm going to go get some like wood ash, probably some chicken manure. I got to see what's around, uh, see if I can get some fertilizers on here. Now all this grass here, I'm just going to throw onto this bed, and I may do an experiment on this bed that is basically, I would take these apple trees out of here. Like, uh, you know, put the potatoes down and throw bunches of mulch on them like this stuff here and a bunch of leaves and things and just see, I don't know, just experiment. That's quite a bit of ash. I usually don't use quite that much. This stuff's kind of wet, so it's harder to spread it out. It's just like an accumulation of coffee grounds from me and my neighbor. It's all shot full of uh, fungus. 
I should be growing oyster mushrooms in this stuff. I actually have some spawn growing in the house in coffee grounds, so that may start happening soon. I think I'll call that good and everything else this bed gets will come in from the top, the top down. Dig this in real fast. Not very deep. All right, it's all ready to plant. If there's any other grass like that with the roots that I dig out that's laying around, I'm gonna keep bringing it to this bed and just start to cover it. So I wanna uh, cut the potatoes and chit them for a while, let them dry off. So I have this random assortment of different potatoes that uh, someone got in town for me. Okay, 65, 65, 80, 65. These are the earlies. Kennebec, Yukon Gold, Red Prairie. I've grown Yukon Gold before. It's okay. I can't give it a much better rating than that for eating quality. But I don't think I've ever grown Kennebec or Red Prairie. Let them sprout a little bit more. Maybe within a week, probably plant those in the ground. Just because I want to get them in the ground. These are all laid out and doing their thing. Two sage plants, sage cuttings, some other stuff planted. These are um, dragon fruit cuttings that were sent to me by Nick Casco. A whole bunch, like each one of these is a different variety. Isn't that cool? The cactus, I've never actually even had the fruit, but I've always been curious about them. Get these planted this week. All right, enough work. Here's the uh, pear tree that I trained up last year, uh, did some videos on. Need to do a follow-up video on this and I'm gonna graft it. It's gonna be a Franken pear. Um, suffice to say, it did pretty well. There's a lot of stuff I wanna talk about. I gotta do that pretty soon because it's, you know, it's time. Anyway, let's go mushroom hunting. I'm just gonna go check two reliable spots real quick. When I say reliable, I mean reliable-ish, more reliable than a lot of spots. One of them I've already got mushrooms from, so I'm probably going to find something. Um, I've already harvested a lot right in here, but you know, it's just played out. Three. This is pretty stunted. This might still be edible. Probably clean that up and eat it. This looks okay. Okay, well there's uh, something to add to my dinner. Okay, so the next spot is a spot where black trumpets grow. That's what I really want. Looks like a little orchid. That's so cool. There's just one leaf, and then check this out. I have seen orchids here before. I'm not sure it was this one or a different one. That is way cool. I'm glad I got to see that. You know, all the fun stuff you get to see when you get out into the world. Everyone's stuck at home, right? No. Like, go to the woods. There's no coronavirus in the woods. Drive to the woods and spend time. Go camping. Practice some real skills and don't sit around at home and, like you're in jail watching Netflix all day. Or just drive out somewhere and walk around all day. In most years, there's some black trumpets in this. I guess we might as well take the scenic route back up the hill and across the hillside. Who knows? Look at all the tan oak that's falling down. Look at, see all this dead stuff here, 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 there, there. Look, dead, 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 dead. Half those trees are tan oak up there. They're all dying from sudden oak death syndrome. Look how open it is right there. It's just because of all these tan oaks are dying and falling over. They rot so fast that like within a year sometimes of when they perish from the disease, they just rot that fast and fall over. Ooh, look, black trumpet, right here. This is what I'm looking for. Yes, this weird black thing is a gourmet mushroom. So now I wanna back up here for a sec, make sure I look around in here. That was just like a single trumpet and then like a little one on the side, which isn't encouraging. Usually they're kind of in clust more clustery. But if you find one, you want to definitely check it out around. Look carefully. Ooh, look at that. It's a bright color. It's just not a good black trumpet year. It's been a while since there's been a really epic year 
and with the tan oaks dying, that's a tree that, you know, they associate with. Here's some. So there's going to be fewer and fewer. Now these are a little old, but I can salvage some. Some of these are too old. Found a couple, but in a year like this, if I went all over these woods for like a few hours, I wouldn't probably fill this basket with black trumpets. 